This episode is sponsored by Skillshare. Skillshare is an online learning community with thousands of different courses on a variety of topics. I've always been passionate about continuing my education, but my crazy day-to-day life has made it difficult to engage in formal long-term courses. Then my partner introduced me to Skillshare and I was hooked. On my own schedule, I was able to navigate the Productivity for Creatives course created by fellow teacher and YouTube content creator Thomas Frank to help improve my material for both our YouTube channel and for my in-person job as a high school teacher. This helpful and perfectly paced course goes over topics such as building inspiration strength like it's a muscle and staying productive when you are your own creative director. One of the things I like most about the setup of Skillshare's vast curriculum is how the classes are organized. The compartmentalization of the lessons really assists in fitting learning into my everyday. Instead of a daunting and lengthy class, each portion of the course is divided into manageable and easily viewable segments, usually in 5-10 to minute portions. Experience the simplicity and learn a new skill today. The first 1,000 people to use the link in the description below will get a free trial of Skillshare Premium Membership, and after that, it's only around $10 a month. Diversely accessible, easily digestible. Skillshare, life lessons that fit into your life. Jean Tuggy was a 60-year-old woman who lived alone in a small house on Erion Street in Pine Grove Mills. Friends and family described her as friendly, caring, and kind-hearted. She was in charge of the library at the State College Alliance Church and worked two jobs, one as a longtime bus driver and another at a grocery store called Wegmans. On January 21st, 2016, Jean failed to show up at a friend's house. Her friends became worried as this was out of the ordinary for her. Her friends then decided to check up on her and visited her house. They found her door to be locked and her blue Honda Civic in the driveway. They soon found a basement door which was left unlocked. They went inside and found Jean lying dead in a pool of blood. They immediately notified police. Jean's body was lying on the living room floor. Her sweatshirt was pulled up to reveal her stomach and her sweatpants were pulled partially down. An autopsy was performed and it was revealed that Jean had been shot twice. One bullet was found in the left side of her face near her neck, which cut through her spinal cord and embedded into her spine while the second bullet that was found was in her hip. A ballistics expert confirmed the bullets belonged to a 9mm pistol. During their investigation, two co-workers told detectives that Jean had mentioned a male co-worker from Wegmans with whom she would developed a friendship, and that he had become romantically interested in her. However, the police were unable to identify this male co-worker. Then, in 2019, Peter Corre, who was a friend of Jean's, told investigators that Jean had once told him about a male co-worker of hers that had rubbed her back while visiting her at her home. Peter said the man was named Chris and had a Polish-sounding last name that ended in Ski. The co-worker was in his late 20s or early 30s and attended the local Lutheran church. The investigators were soon able to identify the male co-worker as 34-year-old Christopher Kowalski through information from a church he attended, internet searches, and address records. Christopher had worked at Wegmans from November of 2007 to October of 2015. The police then went through Jean's computer hard drive and found Facebook chat logs between Jean and Christopher, in which they discussed their friendship and their mutual experience of loneliness. In 2019, another friend of Jean's told investigators that she recalled a conversation with Jean where Jean told her that she believed Christopher wanted a more romantic relationship than she did and that he got upset whenever she refused his sexual advances. Her friend said that Jean was planning to invite Christopher over to speak with him about their relationship remaining platonic. The police did a firearm check on Christopher in May of 2019 and found that Christopher had purchased six 9mm handguns. One of the six handguns, a Walther CCP, was purchased one month prior to Jean's death and then sold off about six months after her murder. The investigators tracked down the pistol to its current owner, who had bought the pistol from a Pennsylvania sporting goods store about 10 months after Jean was murdered. The gun was owned by only two people since it had been made. The owners allowed the investigators to take the gun for testing. A forensic test was done on the gun and the bullets recovered from the crime scene. 
Although the results were inconclusive, the test bullets and the bullets recovered from the crime scene had similarities and matched the bullets in all characteristics. An expert stated that the minor differences in the bullets could have been caused by someone cleaning the barrel of the pistol with an abrasive tool. Police found and interviewed Christopher at his home in South Carolina. He initially claimed he and Jean were just friends and nothing else. However, he later said that he and Jean were romantically involved. He told investigators that on the day Jean was murdered, he went to her apartment to watch movies together. He claimed that as he was taking off his coat to hang it on her coat rack, his gun from his coat pocket fell to the floor and discharged. The bullet hit Jean in the hip. He then allegedly picked up the gun and it was jammed when he tried to clear it, so it fired again and struck Jean in the neck. He stated that blood was everywhere and claimed he did not try to save her as he knew it was too late. After the police told him that his story did not make any sense, Christopher admitted to shooting and killing her intentionally. He allegedly said, quote, The truth is, I killed her. I killed her because I was depressed, down, and hopeless. I was having a midlife crisis. He said that he first shot Jean in the hip and she fell over the couch. The gun jammed, but he was able to clear it and shot her again in the neck. He also turned off her oxygen to make sure she was really dead. He said that he pulled her pants down and had planned to take pictures of her undressed, but did not as he was afraid his clothes might get blood on them. He then picked up the shell casings, locked the front door, left the house from the basement door, and disposed of the casings outside of a restaurant. He told investigators that he had planned to kill Jean before her murder and that he chose to kill her because she was an easy target. He moved to South Carolina in 2016. Christopher was arrested and charged with Jean's murder. He will be extradited to Pennsylvania to be prosecuted. Felicia Howard was a 21-year-old woman who lived with her 4-year-old daughter, Denisha, in their second-floor apartment at 3804 Washington Street in Gary, Indiana. Felicia and her daughter, Denisha, had recently moved from Indianapolis to Gary in January of 1992. They stayed with Felicia's father for a few months, but on June 7th, she decided to move away from her father's house and get her own place on Washington Street. However, her landlord would send her an eviction notice on July 10th, reportedly due to her lifestyle. On July 11th of 1992, Felicia picked up Denisha from her regular weekend stay at Felicia's father's house. This was the last time her father saw either of them alive. On July 15th of 1992, five days after sending the eviction notice, her landlord brought prospective tenants to show the apartment. When he opened the door of the apartment, he found Felicia and Denisha's body. He immediately called the police. Both mother and daughter had been shot to death. Felicia had been shot in the chest. She had been found lying nude in her bed and appeared to be reaching for Denisha, who had been shot in the head. The investigators were able to collect DNA of an unknown male source from the crime scene. The murders shocked the residents in and around Gary. Several locals raised money to set up a reward for any information regarding the murders. Neighbors would later report hearing Felicia screaming, quote, Please don't shoot me in front of my daughter. They also reported to have heard a child standing on the balcony screaming, quote, Help, help, and, quote, Stop, stop, for about half an hour. However, no one came to help. No neighbor mentions why police were not called, despite obvious pleas from the now deceased victims. With no leads and no suspects, the case would soon go cold. In 2019, the FBI's Gang Response Investigative Team, or GRIT, reopened the case and began investigating. With the help of DNA technology and re-interviewing witnesses, they finally were able to find a suspect. In September of 2020, 56-year-old Victor Lofton was questioned by detectives and asked to give a DNA sample in Tennessee. During their questioning, investigators showed Victor a photo of Felicia and Denisha, and he was asked if he knew them. He reportedly bit his lip and admitted that while he did live with a relative in Gary in the 1980s, he did not know Felicia or Denisha. Victor's relative confirmed that Victor had lived with him for a couple of months in 1992. He also told investigators that Victor owned a Browning 38 caliber handgun. 
The spent shell casing found at the crime scene had markings consistent with the 38 caliber handgun. The U.S. Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, Firearms, and Explosives was able to recover the handgun owned by Victor, and a forensic analysis was conducted. However, the analysis could not identify nor exclude the bullet to have been fired from the handgun. Investigators analyzed the unknown male DNA found at the scene. The analysis showed that the unknown male's DNA matched that of Victor. Its DNA profile was one trillion times more likely to originate from Victor than from any other male. On February 5th, 2021, Victor Lofton was arrested and charged with two counts of murder. He has been extradited to Lake County and is awaiting trial. In the late night hours of June 26, 1984, Fort Myers police responded to a complaint of gunshots heard near Palm Avenue and Lincoln Boulevard. Lying on the ground at the side of the road at 2831 Lincoln Boulevard was Claritha Coco Gibbs, who was bleeding profusely from a single gunshot wound to the abdomen. Coco was rushed to the hospital, but she succumbed to her injuries and was declared dead by emergency physicians. Prior to that fateful night, Coco had lived close by, on Mango Street. Born in Tampa, Florida, Coco moved to Fort Myers from Houston, Texas in 1979. At only 31 years old, Coco had had a rough life. She was a street worker and therefore vulnerable to the various dangers of such an illegal late night trade with anonymous customers. Coco was last seen entering a vehicle, possibly a pickup truck, with two different toned paint colors. Witnesses say that it was only moments after she entered the vehicle that they heard a gunshot and the car peeled out of the area, leaving a bleeding woman on the sidewalk. The driver of the vehicle was described as a white male in his 30s with light brown or dark blonde hair. He was described as having a thin build and was approximately 5'10 with a pale complexion, although the height was hard to approximate as he was seated inside a vehicle. Police said they recovered a rag with the suspect's DNA but DNA testing was not common or very advanced at that time. After a full DNA profile of the suspect had been created from the unknown type of DNA left in the rag, it was then entered into CODIS, the FBI's national DNA database, but it did not provide a hit to any known samples. In March of 2019, Fort Myers Police Department's Cold Case Unit investigators submitted the DNA evidence to Parabon Snapshot, in hopes that the advances made using genealogy research in the last few decades could pinpoint a suspect who was most likely still at large. On July 22, 2020, Parabon Labs completed a report on the genealogy, which indicated that the DNA profile was linked through databases to an individual identified as James Glenn Drennan, 65, of Okeechobee. Investigators began to look into the current life and past history of Drennan and tried to get details on his former link to the Fort Myers area. They were one step closer to answers when they found that he lived in Lee County in 1984, putting him geographically in relatively close proximity to the area that Coco was found. Drennan, who was a local mechanic, acknowledged that Coco was a prostitute and that he had invited her into his truck to engage in her paid services. When police arrived at his house, Drennan admitted to the physical connection, but said that Coco had actually pulled the gun on him in order to take his money after he picked her up for a rendezvous. He claimed that they fought over the weapon and that Gibbs was shot accidentally. Drennan fled the scene and said that he subsequently threw the murder weapon out the window of his truck. In addition to the murder of Coco in the 80s, there were a known total of 16 other women who worked in the same trade as Coco that were killed over a 20-year period in the Fort Myers area alone. While there is no concrete evidence that links Drennan to these crimes, he died of unknown causes at his residence in Okeechobee before police could continue to question him or arrest him for Coco's death. While no details were released, it is suspected he took his own life after realizing his past crimes were coming back to haunt him. Twenty-one-year-old Annette Schnee and twenty-nine-year-old Barbara Bobby Jo Oberholzer were just starting their lives in a most adventurous way when it was tragically cut short for the both of them. On January 29, 1982, 
29-year-old Bobby Jo was hitchhiking from her home in Alma, Colorado to her job in the nearby town of Breckenridge. Unlike today, in that part of the country in the early 80s, hitchhiking was not seen as a dangerous act, and both drivers and would-be passengers were far more comfortable with the idea of riding with a stranger than one would be in today's millennium. At 6.20 p.m., Bobby made a call to her husband, Jeff Oberholzer, to tell him that she was going out for cocktails with friends at a local bar, and not to worry because she would find her own ride home. But Bobby never made it home that night. When her husband Jeff questioned Bobby's friends, they were surprised that she never returned home, as she had left the pub alone at 7.50 p.m. The next day, January 7th, Bobby's husband received a call from a rancher who had found Bobby's driver's license on the ground of his property. On his way to investigate to get more information on his wife's whereabouts, Jeff was shocked to see his missing wife's backpack laying in a field alongside her gloves which, upon further examination, had blood on them. There were also some bloody tissues next to the bag. DNA testing was so infantile in 1982 that the only information gleaned from the evidence left behind was the blood type, which matched that of Bobby, but little else was known. That afternoon, around 3 p.m., Bobby's body was discovered, deceased, at the summit of a lookout point called Hosier Pass, located about 10 miles south of Breckenridge. She was found about 20 feet off the highway and was at the bottom of a snow embankment. The 29-year-old had been shot twice in the chest. She had plastic zip ties around one of her wrists, and the other was free. Also found on the scene was an orange sock that investigators did not think belonged to the victim. Evidence shows, police said, that Bobby attempted to escape the vehicle and put up a fight before being shot and succumbing to her injuries. Her self-defense keyring, a tool with a metal hook on it made for her by her husband, was found in the parking lot at the summit, which was approximately 300 feet from where her body was found, suggesting that she may have escaped and then was again confronted by the assailant. The same day that Bobby was reported missing, Annette Schnee, a 21-year-old resident of the nearby town of Frisco, was also reported missing. The young woman was last seen inside a pharmacy in Breckenridge at 4.45, the evening of the 6th. She was seen speaking to a dark-haired woman who police requested come forward but never did. Annette was scheduled that night to be at work by 8 p.m. at the Flipside Bar in Breckenridge and was known to hitchhike to get to her job. Though she went missing on the same day as Bobby, family and friends had to wait much longer for answers, and some still held out hope that she would be found alive. The death of one woman and another missing, presumed dead, alarmed those who resided nearby. The randomness of the two seemingly unconnected girls unnerved the public, and some spoke of a possible serial killer descending upon the area. Almost six months after she was first reported missing, on July 3rd, Annette's body was found in the shallow waters of a creek located near a remote side road in rural Park County, about 20 miles south of Breckenridge. The snow and cold had preserved the body, and investigators were able to ascertain many details regarding her death. Much like Bobby, Annette had been shot to death, with the bullet going through her chest and exiting with no leftover fragments. Police estimated that it was the bullet hole left by a 38 or 357, possibly a 9mm handgun. They believed she was killed where she was left. What conclusively linked the crimes of both women was the presence of a second orange sock. While an orange sock had been found at the crime scene of Bobby's death, police never believed the sock actually belonged to her, and it was to their surprise that they saw Annette was in fact wearing the other sock, an orange sock similar to the one that was found near the scene of Bobby's murder. It became apparent that this was indeed a match to the orange sock from Bobby's case. On Annette's other foot was a striped sock, and the matching pair to that sock was stuffed in Annette's jacket hood. Police theorized that the killer probably first picked up Annette, who had been hitchhiking, and murdered her prior to picking up Bobby, also while hitchhiking, a few hours later and murdering her as well. Investigators wondered if one of Annette's orange socks, already separated from their owners in a violent and brutal act, possibly fell out of the killer's vehicle and landed erroneously at the scene that Jeff would soon come upon while looking for his wife Bobby. This is the reason that the crime was dubbed the Orange Sock Murders in the media, 
not to be confused with the murder of Deborah Louise Jackson, who, before the body was identified, was informally known as Orange Socks. Later, Annette's backpack would be discovered in another location, off of Route 285. Police were puzzled to find that her bag contained a picture of a man who was unrecognizable to friends or family of Annette. The photo was never identified by police. Even stranger, Annette's wallet also had Bobby's husband, Jeff Oberholzer's, business card in it. When questioned by authorities, Jeff was shocked to recall that, upon thinking deeply about it, he had actually previously picked up the 21-year-old Annette back when she had been hitchhiking months prior to the day of her murder. He recalled that he'd given Annette his business card, but starkly swore that he had never seen her again. Because of this strange and seemingly unlikely coincidence, Bobby's husband Jeff was looked at as the prime suspect for both murders. While Jeff did have an alibi for that night, he was in Alma hosting a friend. It wasn't until December of 1990 that that friend who had visited that night was finally tracked down and questioned by police in order to verify Jeff's alibi. Shortly thereafter, as DNA profiling became more accurate and detailed, DNA testing was performed on the blood from Bobby's glove, and it was found that it was male, not female blood, and therefore they concluded that the blood was left presumably when Bobby fought back, and likely punched her attacker in the nose, which perhaps explained the bloody tissues as well. The lab results showed that the blood belonged to a male donor, but not to Jeff. The new DNA results finally exonerated Jeff, the long-grieving husband falsely accused due to a shocking coincidence, but police were then faced with a shortening list of other possible suspects. At one point, they suspected self-proclaimed serial killer Thomas Luther, who had supposedly bragged of taking the lives of two women in the Breckenridge area, but when police questioned him in prison, he ominously said, "'They aren't my girls.'" Metro Denver Crime Stoppers helped fund the use of genetic genealogy in this particular case. They funded it in hopes that the relatively new technology would help bring closure as it had done for at least five local cases in the past two years. This case would be no different, as new capabilities and databases enabled detectives to finally find a match to the DNA left long ago at the scene of the crime. Testing and analysis indicated a possible link to 70-year-old Alan Lee Phillips, a semi-retired mechanic and resident of Clear Creek County. Law enforcement spent over six weeks investigating and conducting surveillance before finally arresting the now elderly and disheveled man on February 24th without a struggle during a traffic stop made in Clear Creek County. Phillips was remanded to the Park County Jail without bail on charges of kidnapping, assault with a deadly weapon, and murder after deliberation. Phillips had lived in Colorado continuously since the killings and was never considered a suspect previously. His last court date was scheduled for March 8, 2021, but so far no details have come out in the media and it may have been postponed. Much of this work can be attributed to Denver Police Detective Charlie McCormick, who has been working on this case since 1989 and was skeptical that closure would ever come. In the chaos of news, friends and family still strive to remember the people lost. Quote, All I know was, she loved people, a friend said of Annette, who is now forever 21 years old. She was a fun-loving person to be around. She was a wonderful person. That's all I can say, because she didn't have a chance to do anything else. 